You're listening to the Frugal Crafter Podcast. I'm Lindsay Weirich, your host, and today's guest is super special. I first found out about our guest when I went to Craftsy in Denver to film a class, and I was talking about something, and my producer says, oh, you, Angela Fair said something just like that. Do you know her? And I didn't, so I looked her up, and uh, I really like her. I am so glad I got that tip, and not only is she a talented artist, but a lovely human being. She has a successful YouTube channel and online art school, and she travels the globe teaching watercolor lessons. Angela, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Lindsay. I did not know that about Craftsy. What a surprise. Yeah, I, yeah, I was, had a good experience so filming with them. Yeah. Oh, it was so nice. And I was, uh, I think it was, um, I was saying in one of the lessons that, you know, touch the, touch the paper with the back of your hand. And if it feels cool, then it's, then it's still damp. And the producer Cliff was like, Oh, Angela Fair said the same thing. Do you know her? I think you guys are really get along. And I'm like, well, I'm going to have to look her up. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, so thanks well, Cliff, yeah. <laughs> wherever you are, <laughs> wherever he is. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Um, and I've, so I've been following you ever since, and I always just appreciated your generosity of time and information that you would share. And, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's well, been wonderful. Yeah. And likewise, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't remember how, how I heard about you. I'm, maybe it was that we reached, that you reached out to me, but, um, I, yeah, I've been following you ever since. And the, and I so respect the, the intention and the effort that you put into the Frugal Crafter. It's really, uh, I know how much work that is and so generous. Of oh, thank your you. audience. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, one thing I love to do is look at someone's YouTube channel from oldest to newest. And I've seen this beautiful evolution of your painting style. Could you tell us a bit how your painting style has changed over the years? Yeah, you know, it really has changed. And I think YouTube serves as such a time capsule of that, really. I I started out, um, I think I, the first videos I posted on YouTube were right about the time when I really started craving a shift in my watercolors anyhow. Um, I'd been painting in watercolor for um, probably about 15 years and, you know, in between all of life. So it wasn't like, I don't know, I wasn't, didn't feel like an expert by any means, but um, I was craving some kind of expression of me and not feeling free to do that. I felt like I needed to make perfect paintings that didn't have any mistakes. And so it was right about the time where I started encountering artists who were painting in a loose and intuitive style that that echoed what I wanted, what my heart was looking for. And and I got to, in, in the end, I kind of got to show up and, and um, make that transition kind of publicly on my YouTube channel. And uh, so as I discovered things about letting watercolor kind of do its thing and, and me being a partner in that process, you know, that started to happen through my YouTube channel and and through the demonstrations I put up there. And so it's really fun to see that here's a pivotal time in my life where my watercolor took this big shift. And it was the same time as here I'm trying to teach and uh, this on on the Internet. And um, yeah, it's all laid out there as as a history. And now I think of myself as kind of moving into kind of a modern abstract um, style. And um, I still love some some of my loose landscape paintings and stuff. But I I, I really see um, just once you start letting go of those boundaries, how all of a sudden you can do anything you want and call it good. And it's been so much fun to embrace that kind of freedom. Yeah, it's it's interesting to see the go from representational to a little, little looseness on the edges and then have it yeah. just kind of like fade, the, the looseness kind of fades in and fades in and fades in until you've yeah. got um, that more that more emotional, abstract, yeah. but still yeah. powerful. And you can always pick out little bits well, of like. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and leaving th some things unsaid and letting people fill in the blanks. And I think that in indicates a trust in your audience, which I think is such a valuable thing for an artist to offer to the people looking at their work. Um, you know, it's it's not like we're trying to trying to drive a point home with a hammer. Um, you know, it's just I'm going to show you something that I think is beautiful and meaningful to me. And, and what do you think about it and opening that up for them to interpret it? So I love that about bringing in some of that open-ended um, style and process in, in art and watercolor. Oh, absolutely. Your paintings just seem to flow effortlessly onto the paper. <sighs> did you ever get stuck or find yourself into a rut? And if you do, how do you get past it? 
Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny because somebody messaged me today, one of my one of my art friends, and she's like, let's have some painting adventures. And she we're on opposite side of the, side of the country. So I could be like, yeah, let's do that. And and totally just sit on my couch the rest of the day. She's never going to know. But um, I, I thought of, as, as I responded to her message, I just thought, man, do I do what? What's even the point of painting? <laughs> and so here I am talking to you today about making making art and thinking sometimes, you know, do I still love this? And if I don't feel that love, why is that? And um, for me, ruts and blocks and droughts and stagnancy all comes from the same place. Uh, I've noticed that there there's, I think that limit limiting mindset um, either I'm critical of myself, I'm holding back, I'm bringing in an expectation that of, of perfectionism, perhaps. Um, I want more from my art. And, and I think wanting more is a great thing. But um, maybe it's doubts and fears as well. So all of these things can serve as blocks for me. So I know that when I start to lose that joy or that energy, um, maybe I just need to go have a snack, <laughs> but you know, sometimes it really is, okay, I need to unpack what in my mindset is, is blocking me here. What do I need to let go of? Um, and most of the time it is letting go of some limiting belief and, and then lean into the freedom that I really do get to paint whatever I want and get, let that be exciting. And actually, um, when it comes to that, I get to paint because I want to, and I can quit anytime I want, if that's what I would actually want, you know, and and make a shift or do whatever, do whatever. So um, I really try to embrace that freedom because I think it brings so much joy to my work. Yeah. Do you ever feel like there's, um, you've got so much freedom ahead of you? Like I notice some days if I have nothing that I have to do and I've got all day and I can do whatever I want, I just waste that time. I just like, <laughs> you know, fritter it away yeah. on these little things because yeah. like, I got all day. I don't know. Until it's like, you yeah. know, two hours up against a deadline. Then I'm like, oh, time to get to work. Do you ever get, get into that? Or yeah. is it? No, every Saturday in the winter. Yeah. Every Saturday in the winter, every Saturday in the winter, I wake up and I think, okay, I don't want to sleep in too late and I'm not very good at sleeping in. So that's fine. And I get up and I fool around and I clean a little bit and I try to get the to-do list done. And really it's a short list. I should be done by lunch and then have the whole afternoon. And if I'm lucky, I get an hour in the studio, you know, once all is said and done. So I totally relate to that. And I'm not going to beat myself up about it because I think it does. Um, that's also going to be something that keeps me out of the studio. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but it is, it is just a frustrating thing about having all this desire and yet somehow physically not doing it <laughs> so yeah I relate to that oh well that's uh, well uh, you know I I love questions like that because then it's like okay it's not just me other people other yeah. people have the same issues yeah uh, and know, I think when you run an art business stuff. when you run an art business too I think you're so often creating for others so I've realized that I'm still the same as every other hobby artist it's evenings and weekends that are when I'm going to do with the painting that's just for me and so, yeah, it's, uh, that, that hasn't changed really. Oh yeah. And that's so important. And that's something that we get into with creatives a lot. It's like, I used to have so much more time to paint until I made it my business. And now I've got to do all the admin. I've got to do the editing, yeah. I get to do the website and uh, it can be hard to find that time to paint within the normal nine to five that, yeah. you know, you yeah. work as a job. Yeah. And, and you, you know, creativity someone, works. Sorry. Sorry, creativity works best when we just let go of um, when, when we when we don't feel all the obligations. You know, I, I can't paint to a deadline or to uh, somebody else's expectation. And so how do I then, you know, in the small amount of time that I've made, also release myself from the obligation to be productive with it? Because creativity thrives when it's not productive. You know, it's just I came, you know, the usually the stupid, playful things I do that Feel like they're not going to mean anything those are the best things i'm going to paint all year so it's getting in that head space. that's profound <laughs> that should be on a t-shirt what yeah the, yeah what you say you can't you can't be productive you can't be creative if oh how did you put that you just put that so yeah, beautifully i'm I gonna have to creativity is just well creativity is not productive in the way that we are generally define productivity you know creativity isn't doesn't thrive in that kind of environment it needs space um yeah, it just, it, you can't force it. So 
yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't have a short way to say it yet. Um, I don't have the t-shirt slogan, but I'll have to work on that. We need a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Yeah. You seem to have a really good work-life balance. How do you manage the successful business, a family, a healthy lifestyle, all of that in today's fast-paced world? It's not easy. Uh, and I don't, I don't, I don't think any of us ever feel like we're doing it super well. I've gone through a bunch of phases in the last, um, I think it's been 11 years since I started teaching online. And, um, so I've, I've had kids that I was homeschooling, then they, I've had them in school and then now they're all finishing school. My son graduates, um, from high school in just a few weeks. And so we're moving into this new empty nest kind of phase and, that's got its own challenges for time management. I feel like we spend a lot more time in the car uh, going to see the kids and, and supporting their, their ventures and so forth. But um, there's also, you know, always recognizing that these phases go by so fast. And, and I, and I feel like with an online business, it really does time management does matter because you can rob your family um, by being, always on your email. <laughs> um, you know, it's as, as it's as accessible as our cell phones now. So I can run my business from my sofa and never look up or, or only be half tuned into the family. And I don't want that. Um, I think there are times I look back and I regret um, that I was disengaged when I could have been more engaged. And, um, you know, <laughs> there's uh, at the same time, we, we spent, a, you know, we had a lot of flexibility, we got to to do a lot of because I could work from home, because my husband works from home, his business, we had the flexibility of being able to um, drop whatever our plans were for the day and be available to our kids. And I'm thankful for that. Um, in the last couple of years as well, I feel like I'm moving into a new phase with the empty nest thing happening and um, the midlife kind of taking stock. Here I am, I, I just turned 47 last week, earlier this week. And um, so birthday. I'm looking at now, the, thank you. I'm looking at the second <laughs> half of my life, basically. You know, if I'm fortunate enough to live to 90, this is the halfway mark. And so that I think also puts that onus on me to balance my time well. And um, last recently in the last year and a half, I started prioritizing my fitness and three days a week, I'm at the gym in the morning. And so I actually am less productive because my mornings are get, are given up to my, my physical health. And it's been so good for me. It's been relationship building as well, because I'm in a class with a bunch of other ladies. And so I really value what it brings, but I also struggle with the urgency of now I gave up my morning. <laughs> How do I cram a day's worth of work into my afternoon? And that's not really the right mind. Set. So I'm learning to be okay with working kind of more part-time on my business, recognizing and settling into this second half kind of life that I do have lots of decades ahead. If, my, you know, if I, if all goes well, that I can continue to um, just to keep making those steps toward the next goal. I think as artists too, we often see, we already see that consistency benefits us so much when you look back at your, your sketchbooks from 10 years ago, or you can see your growth and it's always been incremental. And so I need to trust that my life will be incremental in growth as well and not be so, yeah, I am wanting to see all those goals met now. Yeah, that's great. I remember, um, I think it was a post that you made and this was several years ago, but I, I remember you saying I, I've launched or maybe, maybe it was I think you posted it on Facebook or something, but it's like you, you were, had launched a class and then you were going camping and going to be off the computer for the weekend. And I was just like, yeah, yeah I like, I haven't, I haven't like taken like an actual day off or vacation since I launched my school on Teachable. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. always at least in an hour a day checking yeah. and responding to comments and stuff. I'm like, yeah. she just, she just, she just went away the week, <laughs> in the wilderness. Yeah. You know, she didn't, you know, I'm like having a panic attack yeah. for you. I'm like, yeah. what if somebody has a problem? I'm like, wow. I was well, like, that's oh. a process too. She knows. Yeah. <laughs> no, she has that's been like such balance. A, I... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's been such a process too, because when I when you start, you know, and everything's online and you want to be accessible. And so there was a time in my in my journey, um, in my business journey where I was on my email every single day. And then I started to think, okay, I'm not gonna go on my email on the weekends. 
And now, you know, even my personal email, I don't look at on the weekends anymore. And um, unless I really know somebody's trying to get a hold of me. But um, and then there came a point where and I replied to every single email I got. I mean, that was just a point of pride for me that anybody who emails me needs to get a personal response. And there, but I knew at some point there's going to be a tipping point. If if my audience keeps growing, I mean, that's not sustainable for anybody. So how accessible should I be? And and that was a question I had to answer. Um, I did down, you know, I did eventually figure out how to hire an assistant to manage my inbox. And so my business inbox, I actually go into about once a week. Um, and my assistant looks at my email and she fl- she flags. I trust her now. We've worked together for for three years now, and, and um, I trust her to kind of flag things that I need to personally respond to. She knows what kind of, um, but but there's a lot of things I just let go of. They're not going to get a personal reply. And um, I just saw an email in my inbox the other day that was like, I sent Angela an email about a week ago, and I haven't heard back yet. And it was like just a a, t- a query about a, a technique or a tool, and it's like. I'm sorry, you're probably not going to get a reply at all, because at this point, I can't personally reply to someone who's looking for advice that they can probably find with a Google search. <laughs> um, so yeah. I've I've kind of let go of that point of pride of having to reply personally to everything. And, um, and it's hard because I want to be connected and personal with people. And I made relationships with people who were emailing me. They're just friends. Can I get you to lean a little bit closer to your microphone? Oh, it's uh, cutting out. Yeah. Yeah. Just a little bit closer. Sorry. Move the mic a little closer too. Oh, um, perfect. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, you build relationships with people. And so I don't want to lose that. But I also have to recognize my boundaries and, and they change over time. So I've I've kind of had to make peace with that. And um, it's been a process. But I know for myself, if I'm emailing someone who I believe is is well known and very busy, then I need to be gracious about whether or not they have the time to reply. Um, as much as my, you know, my connection with them feels personal to me, I, I don't expect it that it's necessarily personal to them. And, and that's been a learning process. I'm very thankful for your great assistant who helps me manage those boundaries. I'm glad you mentioned that because I think a lot of times, I'm sure there are a lot of artists that are watching this podcast today or listening to it who look up to you and they're seeing, oh my gosh, she does all this stuff. How does she keep up with it all? So yeah. saying that you have an assistant, I think is is excellent because yeah. it gives a little perspective on what it takes to run a successful online art business these days. Yeah. Yeah. And it's challenging to hire because you, you aren't always uh, you know, we're used to doing everything ourselves. So we're not always good at communicating what we need. Um, and we're not always good at knowing which things are d- delegatable <laughs> and which things mm-hmm. we kind of want should be or want to be doing personally. And so that's been that's the process. And I always um, I actually meet once a week. Um, my assistant is virtual. So she lives in South Africa. We don't we haven't met face to face. And um, so we meet once a week on on a Google meeting and and um, just go over the week. And, and that's been really helpful. And and uh, and I really try to do a good job of communicating. But I know I could do better. I know there's more I could delegate that I'm not. And it's just a learning process. Yeah, it's hard. I, it's like I don't even know what I would delegate or how I would explain yeah. My process. Yeah. My husband worked in my business for about three years and we finally we got mm-hmm. to the point where it was like. I, he kind of got what I wanted and it, but it was, um, lots of post-it notes stuck everywhere and it it was very difficult. It was, it was like, let me just do it. It's just quicker for me to do it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it, and, and especially because I'm working virtually often it is, it's just, do I, I I could write an email and ask her to do it or I could just do it. And so that's Mm -hmm. my, that's a challenge for me because I do want to focus. I want to stay in my lane. I know I'm going to be better at doing my, you know, doing my work. If I just focus on that instead of oh, getting, getting, I don't know, uh, that squirrel distracted by the shiny object or <laughs> the next nut on oh, the tree. So it's a process. Yep. Yeah. And, and I would love to have someone local that could do video editing for me because that's a really time consuming thing. And uh, so that's kind of something I'm keeping my, my eye on, but uh, living in the North uh, Northern British Columbia, where I live, resources for other people who are experienced in what I do. I mean, I don't know anybody who, 
who I could even ask. So maybe that will change over time. Yeah, it's a, I, I showed Jason how to do the editing. So he did my editing uh, for those three years. And that was great to focus on the uh, the recording and not have to, or the creating the art and not have to worry about yeah. the editing. But yeah, it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard to outsource your production, I think, or your, yeah. I don't know. It's very difficult. It's very difficult. Yeah. Um, I follow you on social media and I see you share photos just living your life in the beautiful Canadian countryside. When you go and do these hikes and I saw your beautiful frozen waterfall, you inspired me. I saw your frozen waterfall paint picture and I'm like, I'm going to go find, I was Googling waterfalls near me. My husband and I drove out <laughs> to uh, an, a waterfall an hour away and um, I'm very spleeny. So it was like 30 degrees or maybe 25 degrees out. So the waterfall yeah. wasn't totally frozen. I'm like, eh, my waterfall yeah. my waterfall is not all frozen like Angela <laughs> was. Man, she must have been yeah. out in the cold. <laughs> Yeah. So do, do, well, you bring, was, do you bring your art supplies with you or, oh, go ahead. I, you know, I do have a little, I have, what I have, I can carry in a backpack. So um, we've actually gone to two waterfalls this year. Uh, we went to another one uh, just in the middle of February with the kids and it was a little further drive, but a taller waterfall and we were the only ones there and it was amazing. But I did not paint then, although I trying to think did I bring my painting stuff I did but I we got to the waterfall and it was just the snow was pretty deep on all the rocks there was no place to sit so so I just settled for taking photos but um I love bringing my painting bag along and I like that it's small enough it's it's like a large pencil case you know and so it can fit in a backpack and I can drop down and and I found that people are pretty patient with you if you're going to sit down and do a painting <laughs> actually they get all respectful <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, oh, she's painting. That's so fancy. And then they they leave me alone for 20 minutes or whatever it takes to do a little a little study. So um, it's been a really enriching way to to just pause and on location. And the day that I did the frozen waterfall painting, I think it was just above zero. So it actually wasn't. I mean, once you've done a hiked in, um, it was about a kilometer. So um, wasn't super far, 15 minute, 20 minute hike. And then. Um, and then, yeah, we were warmed up, so it was nice to just sit and, and enjoy the, the view. So, yeah. Oh, nice. And so that must be uh, Celsius. Yes. <laughs> not our centigrade, yeah. not, uh, not Fahrenheit. Yeah. Um, and I'll just ask <laughs> yeah, you to lean, just to above, lean into just your mic. freezing, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'll have you lean into your microphone a little bit, uh, a little oh, bit yeah. more, too. Sorry. Yeah. I, don't I, think I, we tend to, I think we tend to lean away, maybe lean away when we're talking. Um, <laughs> yeah. I noticed you have a lot of, speaking of going out on location, I noticed you have a lot of on location workshops lately, and you're even going to be in my neck of the woods this summer. I saw Bar Harbor, Maine. Yeah. So I yeah. might have to take a, take a trip out there. That's not too far. Um, so when did you decide to start teaching the travel workshops? Well, I, I wish I could say I decided when I was 19 years old and I would buy those watercolor magazines and flip through and they would have those classified ads in the back for the different travel mm -hmm. workshops. And I mean, looking at those and thinking, um, I, could, I, I couldn't imagine ever having the money to just go on a workshop like that, much less to run one. And um, so in 20, I think it was 2016, I, I've been teaching online for three or four years. And I thought, I would really like to do a travel workshop, but no one is asking me to do a travel workshop. Maybe I should organize my own. I live near some pretty beautiful locations. So I, I organized my own workshop in Jasper National Park, which is about six hours from me uh, driving. And, um, and that was so cool because I had half of my group were from the US. I had someone come from Belgium all the way to, to my workshop. And it, so it really confirmed that this was something that maybe I could do. And then sure enough, you do something like that. You host your own workshop and suddenly that first email popped in my inbox of some a travel company inviting me to teach internationally. And um, I knew that was something I wanted to do. Uh, it was a dream of mine. And so here it was that that dream was coming true. I taught a workshop in Ireland in 2018. Um, I taught in Italy in 2021. Um, and then I was in Cornwall last year. And so, and then, um, I have, I think, four trips planned for 2025 already. So <laughs> I'm embracing wow. the ability to travel and teach. And it is, um, it's not just a wonderful way of seeing a new place, because I think it really is. I think when you see a place with a paintbrush in your hand, and you're going to experience this in France, 
But um, to see a new place with a paintbrush in your hand and just, it, it forces you to sit down and pause. It forces you to put down your camera and to notice in a personal way. And, and so it enriches the experience. And my sketchbooks, um, I, I saw somebody was talking about, um, he, I think his house was at risk of a fire or something. And so they were grabbing the precious stuff and it was his sketchbooks that he wanted to grab. And I thought, you know, oh. yeah, we've got fine art on the walls. We've got thousands of dollars in frames, perhaps, or whatever, um, these valuable paintings. And yet it's the sketchbooks because they hold the memories. And uh, so, yeah, it's it's such a wonderful way to to see a new place. And I also think that because I teach online, um, I really value the opportunity to meet my students in person and build those relationships just a little bit further. So that's meant a lot to me. It's an opportunity to not just tell my story, but to hear theirs. And I've really loved having that opportunity. You get nervous at all when you go <laughs> yes. teach in a new place? Oh, oh yeah. Really? Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I taught it. I, I, I will tell you what one experience that I had, because I think it really, um, maybe it'll encourage you as you think about France too, but um probably was one of my second or third um, in-person workshop that I was teaching away from home. And I was in Vancouver with this group of artists and I had a real range of skill levels. And I had one fellow message me at after the first day. And it was, I think it was just a two day workshop. And um, he messaged me after the first day and he's like, I don't know if I'm going to come back tomorrow. He's like, I'm pretty new to watercolor. And this just felt really overwhelming. And, um, and so I messaged him, I'm like, you know what, you, you're not obligated to come back, but you know, you can also come back and just not paint at all if you want, or just feel, know that, you know, we don't have any expectations of you come and just trust that you can receive what you're gonna, um, what you're gonna need. And, um, and then I lay awake all night, <laughs> um, because, Aww. because when you come to a, teach a workshop, um, you don't know who you're going to encounter and you don't know what they're expecting from you. And so it's very easy to get into that. Um, and I'm a bit of a, ple I'm a bit, I'm a people pleaser. I want other people's approval. I've always, I'm, I'm a classic oldest child. I'm a classic, you know, whatever it is that makes me want to just meet everybody's expectations. But uh, I don't get to read people's minds. I don't have that ability. So I have to just kind of, I, I feel like I do it prayerfully. I come into a workshop like that and I, and I just think I'm just going to serve people to the best of my ability. I can't do, I can't do more than what I know how to do. And so I trust that I'm there for my people. <laughs> I'm there to hear them. Um, I'm there to be as present as I can be and engaged with others. And it's not about my ego and showing how good I am, you know? And so uh, when we come with that kind of mindset, I do think there's something really special that happens. And then we can let go of that fear of letting people down because, you know, you know, you gave everything you had, whether or not it was what they were expecting. <laughs> so that's kind of what I lean yeah. on. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I remember teaching um, at a, uh, it was at a convention in Massachusetts and this woman's husband came up to me and he said, huh, you don't look like you do on YouTube and walked away. And I'm, like, I'm all okay. sweaty and I'm like, <laughs> I'm like setting up my, my, uh, my classroom. And I'm like, I'm like, Oh, I feel horrible now. What am I now going to go teach all these people? Yeah. 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 Well, and it's funny because it doesn't have to be a question even that was necessarily critical. Um, you know, yeah. somebody commented, I, I taught a class last night on zoom and someone commented, you know, this painting doesn't look at all like the reference photo. And I immediately went into like, I'm, she's, she was expecting something more representational. Well, she, I'm, that's not who I am. So I shouldn't mm -hmm. have, you know, but it immediately was like, made me start to doubt myself. And it's amazing how mm -hmm. that just, it, it wasn't necessarily phrased as a criticism, but that's how, what we start to hear. And it's just, yeah. Yeah. Brains. <laughs> I think we, yeah, we like, focus and fester on those negative comments we could yeah. have a hundred positive yeah. comments but yeah. it's going to be that one negative yeah. one that just never leaves our brain it's like living rent yeah. free up there yeah <laughs> it's so yeah and you want to also I think we want to stave them off at the past you know like yes. um, I don't not I don't want to just not respond to a negative comment I want to prevent yeah. anyone from ever having anything negative to say so I'm just gonna like 
anticipate everything. <laughs> and, um, you know, and I, I realized how extreme it was when I actually, um, my, my desire to please people, I would actually, before I would do a live class, I don't have running drinking water in my studio. So I have water bottles and I would transfer my water bottle into a cup so that nobody would see me drinking out of a plastic bottle and think I didn't care about the environment, <laughs> you know? And I just Aww. thought, I'm so, I'm so attuned to not wanting to be misunderstood or criticized that I'm going to take these extreme measures to just, and I don't know, I don't think anybody's Teflon. So <laughs> yeah. Mm. Um, it, it, it's not yeah. an environment that helps me to thrive as an instructor. It doesn't help me thrive as an artist or as, or, or as a person. So I'm, I'm trying to like lean into this newfound ability to be criticized. <laughs> See how I feel it's about so that. It's so hard. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. so hard, especially when you put yourself yeah. out there. And if you yeah. if you look at your comments, if you look at yeah. what people have to say, it's yeah. and I think it tends to be more in the the public sphere, like YouTube, not so much. Sure. It's yeah. funny because people that are paying for classes generally are yeah. the most pleasant yeah. people that aren't going to attack or criticize, but it's people yeah. watching a free yeah. video on YouTube that are going to be like, this woman talks too fast, or you know. Yeah this woman does this, or I don't get that, yeah. or I can't believe I've spent my time yeah. watching this, or there's too many ads, or, you know, yeah. one thing after the, yeah. one thing after another. Yeah, but I don't even, I, many, yeah. yeah, I, I, I don't, I mean, YouTube's not my, not my day job kind of thing. So I don't post on there um, super frequently. And I generally don't, I look at the comments maybe once every six months. I really avoid them. Oh, wow. And, uh, but, <laughs> and, and for the most part, like my inbox, my email inbox and my um, comments on social media, people are very kind. And uh, it's amazing how, you know, one little negative thing said months ago can just derail you and, and leave you kind of, yeah. Um, but one thing I am learning too is that in in opening myself up to be more authentic and to talk about things that I might get criticized for, I think I also give other people the opportunity to extend a, a little bit of grace and acceptance to me. And I want to extend that to other people. So I also need to open up my life a little bit so that I can receive it and trust that people will offer it. And um and it's and I think the relationships that come out of that are just a little bit more genuine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think people want to know there's a real authentic person behind the <laughs> lens, not somebody that's super perfect or, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, doesn't have a life outside of their business. It's it's yeah. good to see. It's good to see the little pictures of the hikes and the family and, yeah. and all of that, <laughs> I think. Well, and even I, I know I talked to an artist um, last year who she has she had um received a lot of recognition for her art and she had done a lot of traveling and I was, and it was interesting because I was talking to her about this. I have a family of my own and I have these opportunities to travel. And, and she said, well, she's, and so I was kind of congratulating her for being able to do all the things. And she's like, well, she says, I don't know if I did it right. I don't, maybe I was gone from my family too much. And she still carries a little bit of doubt, doubt and questions about her work-life balance. And I just, you know, I respected that so much more than just somebody who gave me the quick answer and said, oh, yeah, it was all great. I'm so blessed, you know, and um, mm -hmm. to recognize that we do make hard decisions and we don't always make them right. And, uh, you know, that gives me um, the freedom to make choices and to sometimes doubt those choices. And I think we need mm -hmm. that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. Life is made in the messes, as, as yeah. they say. You yeah. get it. You either succeed at something, you learn how to do it the next time, and you yeah. get a little bit better each time. Yeah. And you learn um, a lot from failure, too. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. How many times have you said, I'm not doing that again after, <laughs> after right. a year? I think that's, oh, yeah. I think that's most of, um, most of learning paint, uh, watercolor, anyhow, is looking at your painting and going, well, I'm going to try not to do that in the next painting. <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. I'm gonna use a lighter Just a touch piece of paper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Have you have you ever? Um, because I I don't paint abstract, but I would imagine it would be kind of similar. Have you ever done a painting and then you're like, oh, that's awful. I'm gonna have to re redo that. And you walk away and you come back and it's like, actually, that was totally passable. You know? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I don't. I try to not judge anything while I'm painting it. Um, 
you know, I heard, oh, I heard the advice. same ones. Don't judge, don't judge anything when a brush is in your hand. You can't be the artist and the judge. And I oh, wow. really believe that because there's so much emotion that goes into art. So to be able to step away and then trust that when I come back, I'm going to see this differently. And sometimes mm -hmm. it's like the most exciting thing I've painted. I, my energy is so huge. And I come back the next day and I'm like, eh. <laughs> so that happens too. And it's funny yeah. because um, that experience and that high emotion, I love that. And I'm not going to... I'm not going to criticize a painting that doesn't have staying power. <laughs> At least it gave me that experience. But uh, yeah, it's, but it's amazing how often it's more likely that we're going to be critical of something. And then we come back and see um, some surprising beauty in it that we couldn't recognize at the time. So, yeah. Yeah. I love that. Don't judge a painting with a brush in your hand. I think that's profound. That yeah. should be on a t-shirt. Yeah. We get a, make a yes. need to be making a list of your t-shirt designs. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was I had an instructor once and he um, had this uh, this artist that he followed Jim Fitzgerald, I think, was the artist that he enjoyed. And he said that um, that this artist did not like any of his work and wouldn't even look at it for like a year after until about mm -hmm. a year since he painted it. Yeah. And a, a critic asked, how come you don't look at your work right away? How come you wait? And he goes, because I can still remember the battle during that yeah. first year time, yeah. I need to look at it after I forget the battle so I can see it objectively yeah. and uh, kind of yeah. forget the struggles I that. that I had. Yeah. yeah. When you're, especially if you feel like you're problem solving your way through a painting and it's not going the way you thought it was. And, mm -hmm. um, and if you spend the whole time trying to steer it back on track. And uh, so then you've got all kinds of emotions of failure, really. And so, yeah, how do you look at your painting and distance from that, that emotional feeling of, yeah, letting yourself down. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. the challenge. Yeah, I think if you're if you paint, uh, probably like you know when you're painting and you're in a great mood, the sun is shining, you're just feeling great, and you're and you're painting and you're feeling great about that painting, yeah. and the next day it doesn't seem as good as it, as it was when you were painting it. I think the opposite can be true if you're really down, you're feeling depressed yeah. or uh, creatively blocked or whatever, and you're you're working on something and it just seems like utter garbage, and then mm -hmm. maybe you took a picture of it and posted it online, and you're scrolling back through your pictures and you see it like six months later, it's like oh that was actually pretty good. Why was I so upset about yeah. that you know your mood can infect how yeah. you perceive your work I think yeah yeah and I um, actually think um I'm starting to think that I I want to come to my painting with a certain energy but I actually kind of think mood has very little to do with um whether or not the painting's going to turn out because you can very much feel like you're failing all the way through the painting and then come out with something that's you know just has some kind of magic to it so yeah I don't know do you ever feel the pressure that you have to produce something for your classes or social media, like on a, do you, do you set yourself deadlines like that? Like I have got to get this lesson done today for my, right. um, for my online class or my art group. Yeah. Yeah. I'm working on a new project right now. Um, you might hear a dirt bike in the background. It's my son is home from school. <laughs> um <laughs> I'm working on a project right now. I'm working on a new, um, it's a monthly series of kind of a look at not just my painting process, but the experiences that inspire the painting process. So like in April, I'm going to share the frozen waterfall adventure and then the painting that kind of came out of that adventure as a combined package. So I've been working on that and, and this is brand new for me to bring people into my life and then into my painting. Uh, I love the idea of sharing that, um, you know, it, not, what's happening in my painting has so much to do with what I'm experiencing in my life, even when I don't go anywhere and I'm just walking in my backyard. And so that has been um, definitely feeling that need to be productive so that I can have these these videos to, to come out at a certain time. So that's been um, the focus of my last month has been just working on you know, all of that and trying to estimate, you know, can I make paintings um, that show my process well and share my experience. Can I can I do it in the amount of time that I want to allot to this project every month? And uh, what's that going to look like? So it's been a learning process, and um, and I think uh, I don't know how to describe it. I'm being I try to be very very expansive with my creative process, 
so that it's not being judged by whether or not the painting turns out uh, or, and, and, and that, because each painting is going to inform the next one. So this is an ongoing process that doesn't have a, an end date. <laughs> but at the same time, you do still want to have something beautiful to share with your audience. So that is a, there's a tension there. Yeah, for sure. I, I hate that up up against a wall deadline where you're like, I've got to have this done today. And then yeah. the, the idea drip just the idea faucet just turns yeah. off and it's like, ah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's very stressful. Yeah, yeah I wanted um, to share you... a video sh talking about design um, in context of this of this lesson. And then I so I created the first video and then I went to go edit it and I'm like, you know what, this didn't really, I have a better idea. <laughs> so then, you know, that's often my, my method is that the first, the, the first amount of time I invest doesn't bring the fruit. You have to come back and show up for that second round, sometimes further. And, and that's hard mm -hmm. to, I, I keep thinking that at some point I'm going to be just good enough that I can do everything in just one try. But I actually believe that part of my process is the idea of, um, being willing to scrap or abandon an idea and go and try again. And I think it's a big part of, yeah, my practice and my business. And I just need to make peace with the fact that this is how it's supposed to be. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, this stuff, this is funny because it kind of dovetails into uh, the next thing I want to talk about just like how your YouTube journey went from going for more representational art and evolving mm -hmm. over time into this more holistic, yeah. um, abstract work. It seems like your online classes have gone from very um, specific. Here's a class to learn this. Here's a class to learn that. Here's a class to learn yeah. that too. Here's a class on how to be an artist and how to be your favorite artist and paint the way you yeah. want to paint instead of like, here's mm -hmm. how to paint this tree like me. Here's how to paint this thing like you, you know, yeah. I, Correct me yeah. if I'm wrong, but it, it seems like your te your teaching style has gone that way as well. Yeah, yeah, that has uh, I, that has been the process, and I, I'm very very thankful that I have a little bit. Like I, I think I've established enough of an audience or um, just a foundation there that I'm able to to be able to say I'm not going to worry so much about what other people are asking for. I'm going to create what I think is in my wheelhouse or the, what I'm most passionate to share. And so um, I love teaching. Uh, I, I notice that when I have the camera on, I can't help but teach um, as a watercolor artist and talk about why watercolor does what it does and talk about design and composition and all the things. But I also love talking about the mental battle of, okay, I'm noticing that my brain is, is going into critical mode and what does that mean? Um, what, you know, why am I, how do I steer back to that freedom and um, relationship that I want to have in the painting process, the freedom and presence that I want to bring to my painting. And so I love being able to share all of that and to be more direct about it. And I certainly didn't feel like I was free to do that early on when I was trying to establish, you know, that kind of customer base. Um, I was sneaking mindset in with watercolor technique, and now I get to be a little more direct about it. I was actually planning to make a six month course on artist identity and mindset. That was my original goal. And um, I realized that it wasn't really a good fit for me to try to package some kind of curriculum on mindset that was going to last six months. I just thought I'm going to, I'm going to burn out the people who want to commit to the whole six months <laughs> and all of the wisdom out there that says you, your online course, you should have a little course and a free course, and then the big course with all the, you know, with the big ticket price. And I'm, I, ju I just started thinking that doesn't work for me. I what, what I really want to do, what I'm really excited to share is what I've always shared. You know, my very first YouTube videos were, my kids are napping. I just learned something exciting about watercolor. I want to tell you about it. And so bringing people into my life, that's always felt like the most exciting thing to do. It's why I love social media. I love posting on Instagram. <laughs> Because I get mm -hmm. to, you know, do that. I get to have a list, little more well-rounded um, snapshot of my life. And so how can I do that as an artist and share my journey in a way that maybe helps encourage other artists who are, you know, on the, on the journey as well and maybe a little bit further back. And, you know, really that's a mentorship model. And I love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you went from giving people what they want or what they thought they wanted to yeah. what they need. 
which yeah, is Yeah, people beautiful. are always going to ask for step by step how do I make a good painting? And um <laughs> my and my general response now would probably be well, what makes a good painting? How do you know if a painting is good? You know, we have to define that before we ever um, start thinking about, yeah, what those steps are going to be and what makes your painting good for you. And really, we paint for us. You know, all of us are painting because it's something in us wants to paint. So how do I make a painting that I get to be happy with? And how do I give myself mm -hmm. freedom to be happy with what I'm making right now? Yeah. Um, so did you have to scale back your online teaching to add in all these workshops, especially where you're going into like four workshops next year? Yeah. Um, well, one thing that's exciting about the doing this heart led artist journey um, course that I'm working on is the fact that I do get to kind of bring my camera with me when I travel and share um, what I'm, you know, what I'm experiencing over there. And so I'm ideally uh, I have some space to, you know, when I'm going to be traveling, I can have that month's content recorded in advance, um, which I'll always be trying to work at least a month, uh, if not two months ahead. And um and then get to share that experience. Not everyone can afford to go on a travel workshop, but uh, I love being the idea of being able to kind of give a look at, you know, what's what's going on here and why why this is special, and uh, and just share it a little bit more. I have a wonderful privilege in being able to teach these travel workshops, and I love being able to share that as well. So, um, so I've been changing my business model just over the last couple of years, uh, just here and there, just trying to figure out what's going to work for my lifestyle now. And so I'm, I'm excited about um, doing this kind of month by month journey, journey course that gives me a little bit more freedom. And I think it should work well with my own personal artistic development and my travel and then I get to share, you know, how all of those things um, work together. So uh, in, in the hopes that it does encourage other artists and help them to think about their own process. Mm -hmm. Does the Heart Led Artist course, does it start, did it have like a start date and everyone joins at once or do people dip in as they can? Does it, is it ongoing yeah. or does it have an end date or how, how does ongoing. that work? Yeah, yeah, it's it's going to be ongoing. I haven't, I, I opened the, it for enrollment on Monday, so um, March 4th. Oh, okay. And so it's right, right around the corner. So we've been just getting all the pieces in place for that first month. And then, yeah, the way it's set up is that people can come and go. Um, unlike a course that gives you this six month commitment and runs once a year, it is something that people can think about how it fits in with their lifestyle and make make time for it. So um, I really wanted I, I think one of the things with online courses is um, overwhelm <laughs> and procrastination are two enemies of online learning. Um, we we sometimes uh, purchase a product that just has so much content, we never get it done and then we feel guilty about it. Or we purchase a product and never just never make the time. And so I wanted something that was kind of gave some room and some grace to fit in with a lifestyle. So, yeah. Well, that's great. We'll definitely put a link to that in the show notes yeah. and the video description for anyone that wants to check that out. Uh, mm -hmm. What advice do you have for artists that are struggling to find their style? <sighs> um, <laughs> I have to look back at my own life. And, uh, you know, finding your style is, uh, it's funny because I don't think that we really get to define st our style. Um, I believe for me, I at least I can't say my style looks like this. There's a lot I don't know about what's ahead for me. But what I do know is that my style now, any consistency in my work that people see and call my style if there's that consistency, it's because I'm doing things I love. So the your style is really just the things you do consistently in your art. Um, the brush strokes you use, the way your hand holds your brush, the colors you gravitate towards, the subjects you love, um, just all of those things, the way you move, <laughs> um, those inform your art. And that is where your style is. So it, the best advice I can give to anybody is do the things you love to do, <laughs> make the marks that look good to you. And that is going to create a style for you that makes you really happy. And uh, I love that idea of just, oh, do I like this? Well, I'm going to do more of it. That's easy. You know, finding your style, that's hard. But just saying, okay, I'm going to look for what I like and try to do it more often. You know, we can all do that. So yeah, I, that makes me excited. 
Yes, but you the, you just got to paint. You just got to put the brush to paper yeah. and make yeah. time for and it. Bring, and... Yeah, and bring diversity in, you know, learn different things. So you have all kinds of different ideas that you like to use. And uh, so, yeah, it's it don't feel like you can't make, you know, you can't do that color or that you can't use that tool or that medium because it doesn't fit your style. You're, you know, you're always bringing your favorite choices into whatever you're doing. And so you do have some freedom to evolve because you're going to evolve slowly and your style is going to evolve with you. I always think abstract art is kind of difficult because you have less of a framework to, to work within. Like, but you would still have that frame. You would still have some sort mm -hmm. of framework, wouldn't you, with the elements yeah. of design and whatnot. Can mm -hmm. you, um, I don't know if you can describe yeah. this in words, but I'm going to ask you to anyway, <laughs> but could you describe yeah. how you would like build a painting abstractly? What, what sort of, yeah. um, what sort of characteristics would you look for? What sort of rules mm -hmm. would you try to follow or what sort of elements would you try to get in or think about yeah. when you're well, you do. You have to start with, yeah, you have to start with some kind of something. And so sometimes it's just what color do I feel like using today? And, and, um, and then that first decision is going to inform the next. And I think for me, abstract painting is basically that. It's an immediacy of process. So I, I only have to make one decision to start. And then that decision is going to inform the next one. So say I choose a yellow like my shirt, which is a color I love to use. And I do a big splash of color across the page, a big bold mark. Well, then I'm, I'm going to re want to react to that mark. So maybe I'm going to. I, I don't want to make the same mark again. So maybe I make a small mark because, to counteract that big mark or several small marks. Or maybe I make a soft mark. Or maybe I soften the original mark that I made. Or maybe I bring in a complementary color. So I have all kinds of ways of reacting to what just happened. And then once that's been done, well, I react to that. And so it's this ongoing, it's, it's just being very, very present and thinking, okay, what does the painting need now? And, uh, and that's a lot of fun um, because it's, I, I think it brings in um, the principles of design that are about um, kind of the harmony and also that variety, you know, those two things are happening. And, um, and then you have a lot of freedom within those two ideas to, to bring in, you know, whatever you feel like the painting needs. So yeah, it can be a lot of fun. It's like having a conversation. You've got like this, yeah. this mark informs the next mark and mm -hmm. you kind of bounce the, the things. That's yeah. a great, that's a great way to, yeah, I, to you know, explain I really, it. And I really love saying that it is relational because I mean, we don't want to hang out with people who don't aren't listening to you because they're so busy. They've got their conversation all planned. Right. And that's mm -hmm. so much of what that I feel like abstract painting or intuitive painting is for me. Um, even when it's more representational, it's okay. What does the painting need right now? What am I seeing, and how am I responding to what I see? When you're when you're working with a student, what would you say is the um, the number one thing that you need to advise students to do? Like, what's what's a common mistake that you see students mm -hmm. making? Well, that's a good question. Oh, um, I know. Sorry, I didn't prepare that one, but then this the whole conversational <laughs> thing, you know, one thing you say yeah. makes me think, oh, I wonder. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think we limit ourselves a lot. Um, I think we think we need to fit in just one, one kind of space and we don't want to think too big. Um, because I think, I, I think about my own practice and really when I started painting, I would have it would have blown my mind to think that I'm painting with the freedom and, um, and painting abstractly. Like, are you kidding? I would not have imagined that for myself. I thought that the, the things I talk about and the things that matter to me in my art now, I would have thought was some kind of fancy woo woo kind of, <laughs> um, art, you know, artist, um, you know, a highbrow kind of artist thing. And it's not, it's really very personal um, because it's an expression of belief in, in my, my freedom to just pour my heart out on the paper. And um, so I think we sometimes hold ourselves back just thinking about all our, our shoulds and have tos, all the things that we think our art should be, um, instead of just seeing the beauty and promise and, and the enjoyment of what's there. 
And um, so we tend to just limit ourselves that way. I think it's a can be a very fearful space to show up and make art without knowing, do I have what it takes? Can I? And and you do. You just get to have some fun on the paper. And I take my art very seriously now, but I also have so much fun with it. I make it into a game and there is nothing more fun and freeing than putting this massive, messy scribble on the page and then saying, okay, now what am I going to do with this? Let's find out. Um, and so, yeah, just being able to offer myself permission to do that is, is so rewarding. And I would love to offer that permission to every other artist and help them embrace that idea of just total freedom. Oh, that's a great, that's a great answer. Yes, guys, you've got to paint and be free and just make, yeah, yeah, make a scribble and see what comes next. Don't apologize for your messes. If it looks like a kindergartner made it, you're doing it right. <laughs> Uh, oh, you that's know, because wonderful. then, because kindergartners, um, or maybe even younger than that, there's le so little self judgment. They just have so much freedom. That's what we want to emulate. Um, and there's all kinds of expansion that can be built on top of that freedom. Do you have any tools or supplies that help you uh, kind of like unleash? Like, do you have some? Yeah, it could be a homemade tool, could be a, something you buy that just helps you break free and create. Yeah, I have a few things. Um, one is just the easiest thing in the world is spatter. Um, if I am feeling tense or limited, um, the first thing I'll do is just spray um, some water on my paper to loosen up whatever I've just done, letting go of those decisions I've been making um, by, by letting the water take some of the some of that control away is very freeing. Um, and then the other thing it's sitting here on my table so I can show it to you um, is this is a powdered graphite. And I bought this cool. because it was sitting on the shelf at my art supply store and no one else was going to buy it. Nobody else in my community is going to use this stuff. And it just a luxurious jar of powdered graphite has no practical use in a watercolor artist studio. But to take this with my brush and splatter it on the paper, this dirty mist of charcoal, basically, and then moisten it and watch it flow. It's just the coolest thing. And right behind me here is, uh, I know it's kind of blurry, but that's a painting that I did entirely with that powdered graphite. And it's just so much fun to just put some of that on the paper and, and try to see a pattern in it. So yeah, it's fun. Does it stick to the paper once the, the painting is once dry? You've got or it you have to wet, it or? Yeah. It, once you've got it wet, it, it does kind of, I mean, it's gets, sometimes I'll put it on so thick it's kind of pasty. Um, and then uh -huh. I do like that, that painting is mounted on a wood panel and then sealed with a spray varnish and then a wax medium. So you want to seal it well, because it will like, you can rub your hand across it and your fingers will come off black. So um, you want to seal it with something. Do you mix it with your watercolor as well? Um, mostly what I've done is just sprinkled it directly on the paper and then added water. And then I will use it with watercolor, like, contingently so oh that's I'm pretty so of, you guys will have yeah. to check out the uh the youtube video if you're listening to a podcast yeah. app if you want to yeah. see angela's beautiful work that's really yeah. cool so, now is that what's yeah. the brand of that graphite powder um it says generals so they also okay. make these little um yeah they make pencils as well so yeah they got lots of graphite on hand Oh, yeah, that should be easy to find for North yeah. American viewers, because I think they're a USA yeah. company. Yeah, and I found Very good. Like, graphite putty, which um, is like a Play-Doh with graphite in it. So if you really want to have some dirty fun, that's definitely going to do it for you. <laughs> and oh, yeah, that stuff looks so messy. When you, yeah, customs agents, when you go through security, they they don't know what to do with that little package of oh my what gosh. looks like some kind of explosive putty or something. <laughs> oh, I bet. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yep. that's funny. I bought some of the uh, powdered charcoal ones because I'm like, oh, this looks mm -hmm. fun. And it was yep. so messy. And so yeah. I wanted to make some watercolor with this. So I took the charcoal and I mixed it with some gum Arabic in a little pan. And I'm like, oh, oh let's nice. let this dry. And it got moldy. It was so gross. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was not a, that was a fail. Yeah. That was a craft fail. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. Yeah. I do have that tendency to buy supplies just because they're on the shelf and I don't have it yet. So, and then mm -hmm. find a way to use it and bringing in a new supply is very freeing. It's a lot of fun. You come at it with no expectations. So of course it's freeing. 
Yeah, I agree. I agree. There's like a there's like a certain balance where you can add something to your your supply stash and it makes everything else more useful and more versatile. And then there's the, the extreme of that where you bring st- more stuff in than you have time to experiment with it. It ends up being a yeah. burden. So it's you got to yeah. you got to kind of find that that delicate balance, like what yeah. one jar of graphite, not like 10 jars of pigment powder, <laughs> I guess. I don't know. Yeah, somewhere. but it's true. I mean, I, I do that with buying color because if I'm buying a new pigment color, um, probably buy one color and not 10 because you have to learn how to use it and what it mixes with and, you know, how it, how it plays on the paper. And with 10 new colors, you're just not going to use them. It's, it's too big a learning curve. I think that's really hard nowadays too with online shopping because if you're going to just buy one tube, the shipping can be as much as the yeah. tube of paint. So, yeah. but you have a local art store, correct? Um, well, it's a corner of a of another store. <laughs> We're in a small town, so yeah. But I, I'm very fortunate because I know the people who work there, and so I can ask them specifically for products. I brought them in my little um, Daniel Smith dot card, and they brought in all mm-hmm. of those colors, and so that's been really nice to to have that relationship. That's the best thing about a small town. But I do tend to order more online uh, for specific items that um, either the price is better or they just don't carry, they just don't have the capacity to carry everything. So, yeah. And I love going to a new art supply store and generally I don't shop in the watercolor section. I want to, I want to poke around in other parts and think, how can I use this for watercolor? So I've been playing with dip pens and um, different kind of mark making tools. This is one of those catalyst silicone shapers. So just, you know, can I use that in watercolor and what would that look like? It's a lot of fun. Have you ever dipped into any like printmaking or anything like watercolor adjacent? Yeah, I actually have a friend who in my community who's a master printer and she does beautiful monotypes and just different kinds of collagraphs and printmaking and and both her and her husband actually. And so she's taught, um, I've taken classes with her and it's so much fun. So I do feel like, and she sees my paintings sometimes and she'll be like, Angela, you're a printer at heart. (laughs) So I do like, you know, that idea of stamping on my paper or just, you know, imprinting, finding new ways of getting paint on the paper. It's so much fun. Yeah. Have you ever tried the um, either gelatin printmaking or the synthetic jelly, jelly plates? Yeah, Yeah, the jelly plates I have. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot of fun. I think I have a yeah. whole bunch. I bought enough so that I could teach a class if I wanted to. <laughs> nice. I probably have enough to teach a class too because I'm, I, I, yeah. I need to get them out more. Uh, I, I have not Julie found Faith a good and- way to actually print, like use watercolor paint on jelly plates. And mm-hmm. I'd love to figure that out. So, yeah. I wonder if you took like, um, I should try this actually. Uh, I bet if you took watercolor and you put it, on the plate or you put a stencil on or some like mesh or just some interesting textures and then you uh you painted the watercolor over it or you painted the watercolor and pressed textures in it and let it dry and then remove the textures and then put like matte medium or just clear gloss gel mm. on your pa- on the over top of the plate on the dry watercolor i bet that would pull off some yeah. really interesting ethereal yeah, looking yeah. textures yeah. Well, and I was toying with the idea of doing like photo transfers and then doing watercolor over top. So I'd love to, I'm I'm trying to develop a method for bringing photo transfers to bring some texture. And I like, I don't want a really crisp, perfect photo transfer, but I'd love to be able to print a black and white photo and then get parts of it on my paper. I think that would be so much fun to make uh, paintings out of. So yeah, there's just too many ideas and not enough time. Yeah, I bet that would work with um like the clear the clear watercolor ground maybe because it that's got like in that yeah. um it's got that acrylic gel in it that may be enough adhesive True. to yeah. be able yeah. to try that. Maybe. Yeah, I tried it with um a lacquer thinner and it's just so toxic that I just I'm I that's not a good method. So yeah. Yeah, if you're printing, if you're printing on your ink inkjet printer or even um, mm-hmm. a laser printer, I think I like a, laser, a yeah. acrylic gel, an acrylic gel, like mm-hmm. a soft gel or a gloss gel medium. Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would think, but it might make, yeah. it might res- make the watercolor resist the paper. But then again, that might be a cool effect if you've got yeah. the watercolor paint well, skipping here and, and there. I don't um, know, lots. Yeah, and there's transparent watercolor ground that you can get now. I think Schminka makes it, and maybe Daniel Smith as well. So I think Daniel yeah. Smith was one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That would be so cool. I mean, that's the thing. Like once you start, and I think watercolor needs this. Uh, we can't just be 
fully traditionalist. I love, I want watercolor to stay contemporary. And we do that by, yeah, messing around with these ideas. Yes, definitely. And, uh, and it's been so much fun to talk to you about these different ideas <laughs> yeah, and concepts that. in watercolor. I think that people are going to be very inspired to hear about it. Um, where can Thank people you. find you if they want to learn from you either online or in person? Um, well, the easiest way is on my website, AngelaFair.com. Uh, it's just, yeah, it's just my name. So uh, you can come find me by name. Uh, I'm on YouTube as well. And you can search up Angela Fair, or I often use the um, username Angel Fair as well on Instagram. And uh, so you can find me either way on, on Instagram or on, and um, YouTube. And uh, yeah, I'm on Facebook as well. So yeah, I'm not hard to track down. Um, my new course is going to be released on a site called heartledartist.com because I am all about being a heart prioritizing artist. So, um, but yeah, again, AngelaFair.com will take you to all the relevant stuff. So I uh, hope to see you there. I do try to send emails. I don't try to, I send an email every week to my watercolor lover audience and just to try to encourage artists to continue to find their freedom and follow their hearts. Yeah, sign up for her newsletter because it's like a little watercolor hug in your inbox every week. If you're right. feeling like oh. I'm just not that inspired, yeah, I I I, I subscribe. There's to your the t-shirt email. right there, Lindsay. Yeah, <laughs> because I'll be like, I'll be like, oh, I'm just kind of like I'm in my inbox and I'm just like doing my bulk deleting because I have so many newsletters that I get that I yeah. bulk delete. Then I'm like, oh, I'm gonna see what Angela has. I'll do me a little. That's my little treat right. in the middle of dealing with my <laughs> inbox. Oh, oh, that's, that's great. Right. Oh, she has such nice things to say. I love hearing what she has. Oh. Okay. Well, it's just, I'm it's just trying inspired. to remind myself of the things I need to hear. And, and fortunately, they are there to encourage others as well. So, yeah. Very fortunate. Fortunate for the watercolor community at large. Okay. Well, Angela, thank you for spending this hour with us today. I've had such a thank wonderful so time much, talking with you. I will leave links to everywhere you can find Angela in the show notes and video description. Thank you so much for listening to the Frugal Crafter podcast, and we will see you next time. Till then, happy crafting and bye. bye.